Professor Landry, I'm really happy to have him here. He's an associate professor at the University of Pittsburgh, and he will soon join NYU in Shanghai in the fall. He's an alumnus of the political science department from Michigan. For those of you who know uh, about Pierre, he was previously a China expert, but I'm sure he will always be a China expert uh, and not leave us. Uh, but he has also forayed into Southeast Asia, into Vietnam, and I'm really happy that he will be here to introduce his exciting work on measuring the rule of law, legal institutions, and corruption in Vietnam. And he has just regaled me with many interesting stories about the challenges he faced um, in actually trying to conduct such a survey work. So without further ado, let me welcome Pierre. Thank you. Uh Thank you, Yuan. It's a great pleasure to be back in an arbor uh, to see how the place is changing year after year. I'm going to switch to my non-reading glasses, otherwise I won't see you. Um, on, a, on a topic which is kind of dear to my heart, I, uh, I have to preface this with, with uh, well, th three things. Uh, first of all, this is a collaborative kind of work, and my views are my private views of the data as we have collectively collected it. Uh, this is not UNDP results or UNDP conclusions necessarily, because uh, I do sometimes go off the script. Uh, uh, the second uh, preface is that uh, even though this is about dispute resolution, I am not a lawyer. Uh, the third one is that I am not a Vietnamese politics or Vietnamese Vietnam expert in general. So there are many burdens here, uh, and I do apologize. Uh, I came to, to study Vietnam uh, almost by accident. Uh, as Yuan said, I'm a China's, Chinese politics person. I also do surveys in China, uh, working with another Michigan person, uh, Shen Mingming, who's at PKU, where I have an affiliation. Um, and because of my past expertise on doing surveys, face-to-face -face interviews at the household level, I was asked to join a variety of programs uh, in, uh, at the UNDP office in Vietnam uh, that are using this methodology uh, to produce data. Uh, you may have heard in the Vietnamese case of PAPI, the Public Administration Performance Index, which is a pretty famous uh, thing now in Vietnam, which I, I helped design. Uh, Eddie Maleski is also uh, very famous for his work on the, uh, on the business side of things with the Provincial Competitiveness Index. And so this particular project kind of feeds uh, off these initiatives, and that's how I came in. Uh, knowing next to nothing about Vietnam uh, and, and, and really coming at this as a social scientist with skills in the sort of data generating process. So if I say things really stupid about legal issues, please forgive me. Um, so what uh, Vietnam is in the process of doing right now is uh, it's having what I've called index fever. Uh, so uh, it's a very interesting uh, way of thinking about uh, relationships between the central government in Hanoi uh, and the localities, primarily provinces, uh, that are pretty difficult to manage sometimes. Vietnam, like China, is a fairly decentralized and busy place, uh, fairly open. Uh, and there is a real sense uh, among uh, central administrators that there is a need to better understand their performance. There is a need to better understand how uh, localities, you know, fair, uh, what things they do well, what things they do not so well, uh, and really how policy implementation boils down at the local level, because it's one thing to design, you know, reforms uh, as, as they are being thought out uh, in Hanoi, and then to see them implemented on the ground uh, in, in, in varying uh, guises. So there's a great deal of interest in doing that. There's also an interest in, I think, uh, reducing uh, malfeasance by naming and shaming basically good and bad uh, performers uh, in the fairly well rehearsed exercises. So every time a survey like this comes out or there is an index being produced, there will be a launch in Hanoi uh, with a big press conference. Um, they invite uh, the leaders of the provinces that have won and the ones that have lost. They invite central government uh, ministers, journalists, domestic and foreign, international consultants like yours truly. Uh, this is being a big event, it's televised, and then within a few days you'll see in the press a lot of discussion about the findings and who's done well and who hasn't done so well, right? And because all of the work is uh, translated in Vietnamese and is, is publicly available, it's very easy for the uh, journalistic, academic, and bureaucratic community 
to actually have access to this data and, 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 and tease it out. So it's become, it's become a, very, a very big thing. Uh, and most of the credit, I think, has to go to, to Eddie, who has done this work on PCI that now has you know, evolved into, into multiple projects, uh, including the one on, uh, on, on, on justice. Um, so let me, let me introduce those three uh, institutions that have done a lot of hard work to make it happen. Um, uh, CICADES uh, is an, en uh, an NGO. Uh, it's the Center for Community Development Studies, uh, which uh, historically is not about doing surveys, but we have actually trained them into becoming a very capable survey research organization over multiple years of doing extensive national projects. Um, this is the kind of main player uh, in Hanoi uh, working with us. The Vietnam Lawyers Association is our sponsor. Uh, they are basically the arm of the government in sort of the umbrella organization for the Vietnamese lawyers who uh, support this. And uh, the coordination and the design and all this uh, dissemination work uh, is done with the uh, law uh, and governance cluster uh, at the UNDP in Hanoi. Right, and who have provided funding for this, and we are very, very grateful. Um, so we, we were tasked with kind of, uh, when we started out, with, with two things. One was to um, try to measure basically the extent to which the kind of legal reforms that Vietnam has been engaged in in the past uh, few years, uh, uh, whether or not this is really happening, what is happening at the local level, uh, in a very practical kind of way. So this is looking at uh, real people, right, citizens, ordinary citizens, uh, who experience, we call them problems. Uh, some problems may become legal problems, they may not become legal problems, they may choose to give up, they may escalate them, they can you know, do all sorts of things. And as they basically climb the ladder, if you like, or the pagoda, as, as, as my colleague Nicholson says in the Chinese case, we kind of try to understand basically the particular mechanisms that they use to uh, resolve uh, their, their problems, right? And, and, and try to understand whether this maps to these initiatives taken uh, in recent years by the government uh, to promote certain kinds of institutions like legal aid, uh, or to, do they instead resort to more informal institutions that traditional sort of village level uh, solutions that, that are very uh, popular uh, in this part of Asia. Uh, uh, we were hoping and we have tried to build some kind of an index, if I have time I'll, I'll get to that, that kind of ranks provinces on various dimensions uh, of, of the degree to which they are in fact conforming to, to these uh, hopes. Um, and then, of course, down the road, this is hopefully going to become a tool uh, for the government to monitor uh, the, the legal and judicial process. Uh, we did a parallel study, which I'm not going to talk about today, uh, of courts, where we uh, surveyed judges and the work, inner workings of the courts and the prosecutors uh, for every single district court in Vietnam, which was a mail-in survey that, 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 that we organized. Um, and we also hope you know, to use kind of evidence-based uh, uh, recommendations to promote further uh, initiatives in the area of uh, defense of fundamental rights uh, and uh, 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 policy implementation at the local level. Um, so the measures, you know, the measures are very practical, very, uh, it's not necessarily a word, experiential. <laughs> I mean, I made it to the dictionary, but I, I like to use that. Uh, because it really tries to understand what people do in a very practical way, right? This is, we try to be as non-technical as possible in the way uh, questions are asked. Sometimes we ask about preferences when we are dealing with very rare events. For example, um, you know, if you were to encounter uh, a, uh, a dispute, a uh, labor dispute, because not everybody thankfully has a labor dispute, then what happens, what would happen if you did the following things, and I'll get back to that in the case of, of land disputes. Uh, and then, of course, we, uh, uh, we evaluate uh, their uh, uh, process uh, in terms of the effectiveness of the institutions, the responsiveness of the actors who are being approached, how accessible they are, the degree of corruption, their professionalism. And of course, you know, because we are social scientists, this is my Michigan Go Blue hat, uh, of ISR and this wonderful department that trained me, you know, we, we, we won't control variables and you know, particular 
uh, uh, markers uh, of those households and respondents so that we can understand the social and political processes that map uh, to those kinds of decisions. So we have a lot of work to do. So the questionnaire uh, is a pretty big document. You know, it's about 40 pages. Of course, there are skips. You know, you don't always, not everyone has all, you know, no one has simultaneously a business case, a legal case, a labor case, an administrative case. And so most people have one or two problems that they focus on in the questionnaire and they skip happily uh, over the, the other issues. I think one or two have all of that combined, but they are, you know, special people in, in, in many ways. So um, let me uh, uh, focus uh, for a few minutes on um, one aspect which I find really interesting, uh, which is the business of land, uh, which is, uh, as, as many Vietnamese call it, a very hot uh, issue in uh, Vietnam. Um, and, and what we found uh, about those from uh, the, the survey that, that we produced. Um, if you haven't been to Hanoi, this is the Supreme Court. Uh, it's a beautiful building. Uh, it's not really a Supreme Court. It kind of calls itself a Supreme Court, but it doesn't has the function of the Supreme Court. Uh, but anyway, they are uh, in, I actually involved uh, in, in some of the, the questions that, that, that we asked. Um, so land in Vietnam is, you know, very contested. Uh, it is, uh, this is an example of a, an initiative uh, near Hanoi where farmers were kind of incensed uh, that the land was being taken away for the construction of an eco park. Uh, led to demonstrations, uh, and there are quite a few of those uh, throughout the country. Just like if you look at China, there are also these sorts of problems with a very powerful government uh, having the authority to support various uh, initiatives uh, in the area of economic development, leading to popular pushback because farmers who have invested um, you know, time and energy in, in, in improving their, their land uh, since they get their, their use rights, uh, are, s are sometimes pushed away uh, with little regard for, for their rights. And so this is uh, increasingly problematic as reforms deepen, as the uh, economy uh, becomes more industrialized, uh, and the need for land increases. Uh, there's a great deal of, 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 of pressure uh, on, on, on Vietnamese peasants, and this has become a, a, a serious uh, political problem. You may have heard a couple of years ago uh, near Haiphong, the famous revolt where uh, the local government, in violation of every single regulation, uh, tried to um, uh, displace farmers and uh, compensate them at their, the value, the initial value of their land, which is against Vietnamese law. They're supposed to be compensated for the value added as well, uh, which led to actually a de facto armed rebellion. Uh, policemen were shot. Uh, there was a lot of stuff going on, and ultimately the central government intervened. Um, and uh, apologized. Prime Minister Zong went on television and apologized on behalf of the government, dismissed local officials at the provincial and municipal and district level, and actually affirmed that the local government was uh, brazenly violating all kinds of laws uh, and instructed the courts to actually be lenient in the disposition of cases, even though uh, shots had been fired, uh, given how intense the problem had been uh, in that place. So it tells you something about you know, the political sensitivity of the question, the prime minister went very far uh, to extinguish that, 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 that fire. Uh, now, when, when we think about uh, this, I mean, I came to this as, a, as a someone who works uh, primarily on, on, on China, and I have, in fact, done uh, in 2005 uh, with the uh, Research Center for Contemporary China a fairly intensive study of similar issues uh, in, in, in the PRC, uh, about dispute resolution uh, in, uh, in, in China. But it's, I think we have to keep in mind, you know, for those of you who don't do Vietnam all the time, and I have to keep that in mind when I go there every time I go, <laughs> that there are really important uh, differences. Vietnam is not just like China, even though some authors uh, sometimes tell that tale. Um, first, historically, I mean, yes, China um, you know, has been around since 49. Vietnamese independence goes back to 45. But when you really think about the socialist experience, uh, what I call the high socialism period of a planned economy uh, in a peaceful time under a unified government devoted to central planning, uh, uh, Vietnam is incredibly short, right? 1975 to 1985, right? A decade, right? 
Was the war economy of the North a socialist economy? Yes, sort of, but not quite. Uh, and, and so if you think about the creation of institutions uh, and, 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 and practices uh, of bureaucrats and how they think about property rights, definition of property rights, the ways in which the government relates uh, to its citizens, um, this is fundamentally very different uh, from the PRC, which has been you know, under unified communist control since 1949, implementing a lot of these uh, socialist reforms early on with even areas of China that had communist rule that predates the foundation of the PRC uh, in, in the North by uh, quite, 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 quite some time. So, so the, the experience of socialism is very different in the, in the way Vietnam has a lighter version of this um, and has gone farther uh, than China uh, in uh, pre uh, defining and defending, uh, well, de facto property rights uh, over land. So Vietnam has a land law, which was revised last year, uh, passed in 2004, uh, that, uh, like in China, defines land as state property, property of the people, the socialist regime. So you don't technically own the land, uh, but you have clear use rights to the land. Um, whether you have a house, or you're a farmer, uh, or you have a, a company or a business, uh, the books have different colors, <laughs> uh, but each color maps to a certain type of, 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 of arrangement, uh, defines uh, clearly uh, your right as a user of the land to do certain things with it. You can uh, alienate that, uh, you can rent, you can sell, you can trade, there is a market, uh, and it's, it's, an, it's an incredibly modern, competitive, market-oriented system, right, that is uh, far more dynamic uh, uh, than what you see, for example, in, in, in China, where farmers, for example, have used rights to the piece of the village land that they have access to, but have a very, very hard time commercializing that particular right into other kinds of things, unless the entire village agrees to do that. Uh, in the Vietnamese case, this is far more individualized, right, uh, than, than, than in China. Uh, International engagement. Uh, my presence, I mean, our presence uh, in, in Vietnam, I think, speaks to this. Uh, the Vietnamese authorities are, I think, very willing uh, to uh, pursue the kinds of initiatives uh, that, uh, uh, you know, improve the quality of the legal system and improve the quality of property rights. I think to a degree that would not be possible without the presence of international players in Vietnam. Vietnam is a very rich terrain for NGOs to work uh, in collaboration with partners, uh, Vietnamese organizations like, like we do. Uh, we're not the only ones uh, working uh, in, this, in this framework. Uh, it's a very different feel, for example, that what is going on in China these days where NGOs are being pushed out in a way and it's not really allowed to operate as NGOs, whereas in Vietnam that's the case. There are also very many domestic players uh, who are very active uh, in, in, in pushing, uh, including, uh, it's not a secret, um, players on this team who are members of pretty high level uh, uh, institutions. One of the co-designers of the survey was one of the drafters of the revision of the constitution working for the National Assembly uh, in, in Hanoi, who's part of the team and drafted the questions on, on, on people's understanding of the constitution. Um, the fact that he's allowed to work with us tells you something about the kind of dynamics that you see in Vietnam that uh, are less uh, uh, or, or not uh, present uh, in uh, the PRC. And then the fourth point is that there are important mechanisms of accountability that, uh, to my shock as someone who studies authoritarian regimes, I had to learn about when I, I, I began to, to think about Vietnam seriously. Uh, oh my God, they have elections for all kinds of things, right? So uh, they have elections, direct uh, elections for the National Assembly, whoa, uh, in which you know, government officials lose, whoa. Uh, you have multiple candidates for you know, more candidates than seats available, what a shocker, right? Um, and the party has to compete against other mass organizations and the, Viet you know, the Vietnamese Fatherland Front and the Women's Federation and the, they all have their constituencies. Um, and, and, and so it's a very active uh, sort of game uh, that is not at all comparable to what is going on uh, in, in, in the PRC in that sense. And then down the system, uh, at the level of provincial people's councils and district councils, although some of them have been 
on an exper experimental basis uh, uh, abolished. Um, uh, as well as the commune level, you have uh, elections uh, for, for, for councils. Since uh, 2007, the villages also have, a bit like in China, uh, a village election, although in the Vietnamese case, the village is the last election, right, of the sequence and the series of elections uh, at all levels of government. Whereas in China, you only have one. There's only election for the village level and to some extent elections for the People's Congress at the township level, but uh, no choice uh, in, in terms of People's Congress elections. These aren't competitive. At the village level, they're very mildly uh, competitive. Um, so it's a very different set uh, of institutions. The party itself also operates very differently, um, technically under the Fatherland Front, right? whereas in China the department corresponding to that title is under the party. In Vietnam it's the, the opposite. Uh, there are uh, also uh, more meaningful elections inside the Vietnamese Communist Party, including recently at one of the congresses for the selection of the general secretary. Uh, Vietnam is also a more uh, divided government in the sense that the major players, uh, the prime minister, the president of the state, uh, the general secretary, and the chairman of the National Assembly are different people, right, who have different interests and, 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 and work very differently, whereas uh, in China we have seen over the years a kind of, kind of fusion uh, of these jobs. So there is, you know, a great deal to think about um, when we uh, kind of estimate how ordinary citizens living in Vietnam engage institutions that you know, they have to work with and, and, and how they uh, uh, resolve uh, their, their disputes. So to give you a bit of a sense of, of you know, what we found, uh, so this is 2011, uh, so we asked the questions about 2011, the full year in 2012, right, and the data was processed in 2013. Uh, we are in the process of doing a new wave of the study uh, for the entire country. We, uh, 2011 was, 2012 was the first time we did a large-scale uh, survey of this sort. Uh, so we designed in such a way that we would visit uh, one-third of the provinces randomly selected uh, in Vietnam, uh, plus uh, uh, Hanoi uh, and Ho Chi Minh City as kind of self-representing hugely important units without which you can't say anything about Vietnam, right? So, so they have to be in. So in terms of the number of units, it's one third of the country. In terms of the population, it's about a half uh, of, 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 of the country. Um, and we, uh, through a design that I can get back to, uh, try to interview approximately 300 respondents per province uh, so that we can have a little bit of leverage about a provincial mean, which goes into the computation of these indices. Uh, if the province is particularly large in population, we increase that size, we double in a few cases, and we triple the sample for Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City, which are, of course, on a different order of magnitude larger than, than, than ordinary uh, Vietnamese provinces. So that took us to about 5,000 uh, respondents for this particular study. Um, in case of uh, labor disputes, not everybody is a worker. We only have basically uh, 16 well, 1,700 eligible respondents. Uh, in terms of economics and trade disputes, business type of disputes, so people who have either a private business or uh, we have also fewer, although quite a, you know, a lot more than you would have in, 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 in China as a percentage of uh, the respondents. Um, and then you have here, uh, and I'll get back to some of that, uh, issues about the incidence of disputes, of so the percentage of people who report having experienced some kind of a dispute in these various areas uh, that we cover in the survey uh, in recent years, usually through the last uh, three years. So we covered um, basically uh, civil and economic issues. Uh, we decided to not even touch the question of criminal law. Uh, and uh, these are uh, individual uh, uh, cases. Uh, so did you personally have you know, a labor dispute? And then if they had one, uh, they would talk about it. And, and labor disputes, as you see, um, are, are the most prevalent of those, about 2%. So you might say, okay, well, that's not very much. You know, do a whole survey and 2% of the people have a dispute. Well, yeah, but if 2% of the people have a dispute, given that you have 90 million people in Vietnam, you know, most of whom are young, uh, many of whom are working. Uh, that's a lot of potential people, you know, who engage in, 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 in these kinds of 
uh, of struggles. So this is not a number to, to sneeze at. Uh, it's larger than in China, uh, for uh, uh, reasons I can come back to. Uh, and the other areas, uh, uh, land, civil uh, environment, are within the range of what we have observed uh, also in, 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 in the PRC. So one thing we, we tried to do uh, in, uh, in the survey was to disaggregate basically um, the prevalence of dispute um, uh, by type of important categories that uh, UNDP uh, tends to, to focus on. Um, so we have a marker for people with a high social status. Um, uh, it's defined basically as to whether you are a bureaucrat or an official uh, or a uh, business owner uh, or a, uh, uh, an important uh, party uh, cadre. Uh, people who have low education, so less uh, than uh, middle school. Uh, people who are designated as poor. Vietnam has a system to categorize people, uh, households, as poor or near poor. Uh, and a marker, of course, for, for gender, uh, which, which gives you a bit of a sense of, um, uh, of, of where uh, things tend to be. Right. Um, so not surprisingly, labor disputes are, as I said, more prevalent at the bottom, uh, with um, a very big spike for poor people. Uh, because, well, poor people aren't business owners and they tend to be the ones who get the wages and therefore you know, they appear uh, as the ones who are engaged in those. Um, uh, not particularly, uh, it's, it's, it's mostly a male uh, a thing, right? Uh, fewer women uh, uh, than, than men. Uh, this is the only place where we have a very obvious uh, 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 gender imbalance, but you know, again, it reflects the labor market more than it reflects, I think, the, the, the propensity of having a dispute. Inherently, there are fewer women employed uh, in, in these jobs. Uh, uh, what is really interesting and intriguing to us is the environmental cases, uh, where basically this is an elite thing. So most elites report uh, having been involved in some environmental case. We're talking to about this this morning with, 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 with Van. Um, uh, I think this is probably a reflection of awareness, right, and a reflection of interest and skills uh, at detecting and working through issues than it is a reflection of the incidence of environmental uh, problems, which is, I mean, much more randomly distributed. Uh, but certainly this is something that the elite uh, in our study uh, were, were quite incensed by and, and, and very responsive to. Um, now, what uh, this is like social science. I'm sure lawyers will be horrified by this. You know, how do we, what do we do with this data? Uh, well, you know, we, do a, we, we drew a tree. <laughs> That's good social scientists. It's a little more than a two by two table. Um, so given the kind of dispute that you have, you, know, you have three choices. Uh, do, you, do you give up? Uh, do you negotiate directly with the party that's causing the problem in the first place? Uh, or do you seek out third-party assistance, which could be government help, lawyers, whatever else, right, as a way of basically sorting out the propensities of people to do things conditional upon the particular kind of case uh, that, 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 that they encounter. Um, so land is interesting here because it is actually one where institutions or third parties are being sought very actively, right? It's the, it's the modal outcome uh, when people have land disputes. Um, um, when people have uh, other types of disputes, whether it's labor, business, government, business, civil, so business to, against consumers or business against other businesses, uh, or civil cases, marriage, divorce, etc., um, uh, obviously people tend to negotiate with, with the other party uh, more, but, but they do a range of things. What's, what's interesting is um, it's not a situation where people have no trust in institutions, where they give up. You know, giving up is not the normal thing to do, right? Um, uh, uh, and depending on what particular kind of issue they face, the propensity to rely on, on third-party institutions will vary, and so that's why I'm here focusing on land. You can see the environment where these elites were very active. So most people who are not elite give up, right? But these people who are doing something turn out to be the activists uh, who are pushing the system, although numerically uh, they are uh, uh, very small. Uh, so this is the bad news. I'm sure now the law school uh, professors can really hate me uh, about uh, this whole enterprise. So 
what do you do? Okay, so if you choose to do something about your problem, you don't give up. And if you go to a third party, uh, uh, or if the third, you know, if this other party happens to be the government, uh, where do you go, right? So uh, having worked with people who have de devoted their entire careers to building rule of law institutions, uh, sponsor uh, legal aid mechanisms, and, you know, programs, training courses, etc., uh, strengthening the role of lawyers, uh, strengthening the Supreme Court, da 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 da, right? Uh, what do we observe? Well, it's a desert, right? In other words, nobody goes to legal aid, nobody uses lawyers, uh, you know, all of that stuff is basically kind of completely dead, and overwhelmingly people either go to their local executives, the mayor, the head of the village, the head of the district, or they will go to the uh, People's Committee at the commune level. In other words, the government, the local government. That's what draws uh, most respondents, right? All this other stuff, the judici judiciary, uh, you know, very small, uh, lawyers' legal aid, uh, almost uh, trivial, right? And those who go uh, to these, these are by dispute types, right? So these are the business dispute, uh, labor disputes, uh, business to government, civil disputes, environmental, uh, and social policy uh, areas. Um, and so you can, you, you can see this is you know, basically the, uh, between those two guys who really are working in the same institution at the level of the local government, uh, this is overwhelmingly uh, what, what people are, uh, are, are doing. Right? Uh, most of the professional partners in this enterprise were a little shocked by the results. Right? Uh, okay. This is a sign that basically these institutions are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Yes, sir. Yeah. We we try to ask that. They basically we had a series of questions about what do you for a second and so on. That's pretty much the only thing they do, and they naturally go to it. Right. Now this is obviously the closest, easiest place to go to because it's your village government, right? Uh, and, and, and it makes a ton of sense that you would go there. What is interesting is that's all they tend to do, right? You would, I would have expected that, okay, you would first go to this particular one, but then they might direct you to some other institution or push you to go to legal aid or push you to, and, and that's not the case, right? At least that is not how the survey caught that particular behavior. Now, I have you know, a question for the future, which is you know, really, do people understand institutions the way we think they do? In other words, when they say they go to a commune, are they going to a commune or are they going to legal aid, or do they not know the difference uh, and think because it might be in the same building that they are going to one and not the other? There's a little bit of noise here, which I think we need to push to be really sure that these numbers are what they are. And I think in the new wave of the survey, we will be very clear that there has to be a better understanding of the particular mode of engagement of this local government because this is a, this is a real puzzle. But it's quite, quite astonishing that, you know, at least from the perspective of ordinary citizens, they don't perceive these institutions, for which there's a great deal of propaganda in the system. It's not that the government has been silent about them, um, that, that, that they don't, they're not seen as particularly relevant. I'll give you a sense of this is a sort of moderately outlandish um, uh, commune office. Uh, it's actually one that was earmarked for being a little too corrupt and having built a little too much uh, by Vietnamese standards. Um, it's very small by Chinese standards. <laughs> but <laughs> if that's corrupt, I mean, boy, well, that's not very much. Um, but it gives, um, it's in northern Vietnam, I forgot. I think it's, yeah. Um, but it's, it's, you know, this is nothing to really write home about, but to give you a sense, this is the kind of a building where there are offices, multiple people. What's important to remember is that the uh, uh, Ministry of, of uh, Home Affairs and a number of uh, administrations in Vietnam in recent years have pushed very hard for the concept of one-stop shop, as they call it. So the idea that if you engage the government for a specific problem, you should have the ability to go to one place, the commune office, see a window and that the person who is responding to your demand or your request or your problem will be able to deal with it and you won't be traveling around basically endlessly 
uh, from office to office, as is the case in so many countries. So there's been a great deal of investment in this idea of, of a one-stop shop. The joke in Vietnam is that, yeah, you go to the commune, that's the one stop, but there are many windows, right? <laughs> so you still have to sometimes uh, negotiate that. Um, but nonetheless, this is basically the institution that most people uh, are, are being drawn to. Um, land disputes, so what are the land disputes about once you start to dissect basically the issues? Uh, very diverse uh, boundary problems, of course, are the modal one. That's you know, welcome to a peasant society where people have fights that sometimes go back decades. We have respondents who claim that their dispute began in 1954, uh, <laughs> still today. <laughs> uh, not most of them, but it's very interesting to see that. There are disputes, a few of them about this uh, LUR, the Land Use Rights Certificate, which is this famous booklet that, that, that is uh, a problem because you know, this might involve who has the right to a particular piece uh, of land um, if, and, and other kinds of things with inheritance, you know, the sort of dynamics that happen to all families leading to, to possible uh, uh, problems. Um, what is interesting in the contrast with Chinese cases that I'm aware of is how much more civil dispute oriented the legal cases about land tend to be in Vietnam, whereas in the Chinese case they're almost always administrative. It's the government seizing the land or doing something to you, you know, as a victim and you have to fight. You don't fight your family over inheritance, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. I mean, that rarely uh, makes it uh, in, 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 the, in the survey result. In the Vietnamese case, it's far more uh, kind of normal, I would say, you know, based on you know, f normal routine family dynamics and market dynamics uh, than, than in the PRC. Now, uh, as you saw, because only 1.9% of the people actually experienced a, a dispute, we uh, played with the, this kind of vignette idea. So if you don't have one, we ask people who didn't, well, if you had one, what would you do? Uh, trying to sort of tease out whether people have preferences for certain institutions and whether the people who have uh, a stated preference vary from those who actually have had to deal with it in, in, in real life. Um, and this, this is the example of the, uh, one of the, the, the hypothetical uh, uh, examples that, that we drew. Um, what's very interesting uh, and actually quite at variance with what I observed in the Chinese survey in 2005 uh, is that the people's potential actions and real actions are almost the same in the, in the distribution, right? They're basically identical distributions. Uh, in the Chinese case, you know, uh, if you had a problem, what do you do? I'd go to court, you know, they'd say that. <laughs> and then you look at people who really go to court, no one goes to court in China, or <laughs> very few people did, right? So they had this sort of stated, you know, politically correct or, 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 or you know, following the, the sort of the, 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 the media or the propaganda kind of wave and, and being very eager to, to say these things and that, that doesn't pan out. In the Vietnamese case, it's, it's amazingly close, right? So it really tells you something about, uh, you know, in a way, the, I think the, the understanding of institutions and, 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 and how they work, which seems to be deeper in this case than it is in, 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 in the PRC. Um, so again, this is another way of looking at the hypothetical uh, versus uh, real cases. What would you do or what did you do, right? And again, um, the preference for the, uh, the going to the local government at the communal ward level in urban areas, uh, again, is by far the, 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 the most uh, 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 chosen uh, course of, 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 of action, right? So very similar uh, kind of, I mean, you can haggle about, you know, Actually, this is the same word. I'm sorry, it's a translation problem. Court judiciary. Um, you know, there's a slight difference uh, in the real cases. They went a little bit more to the courts than in the hypothetical one. There's a significant margin of error here. It's a very small sample, so I don't want to to, to claim too much about that. Uh, but it is certainly very different from the kind of work, uh, the kind of results that we have observed uh, in uh, uh, China, right? Uh, uh, all right, so yeah, this is just a way of thinking about overall what do we see. In other words, if you move away from uh, land disputes to all types of disputes combined, you can see the distribution is not very different. Uh, land versus social policy, uh, again, um, land has a little bit more ten, you know, in terms of, 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 of judicial institutions. Social policy is a much more administrative kind of problem. 
It's whether people have, you know, do you get the help that you're supposed to get as a veteran? Lots of veterans in Vietnam. Uh, are you on the list of poor people when you're supposed to be uh, and get the kind of subsidies that are attached to that? Uh, there's a great deal of that going on. And, and, uh, uh, and again, this, these policies uh, map to local governments. That makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, environmental disputes, uh, kind of similar story, right? So, so basically, uh, what we see for land, uh, uh, no matter how, you know, how important it is, uh, is the kind of behavior that we see throughout these other kinds of disputes that, that people uh, uh, experience. Now, another way we, we kind of thought about uh, uh, people's sort of attitudes towards the law was to try to dig uh, uh, the, you know, the experience of the minority of people who claim to be in a place for which they don't have a land use certificate. They're required, everyone's supposed to have one. So if you don't have one, something is, is amiss, right? And so we try to say, okay, well, if, if not, what's going on? Um, and, and here the results are quite flattering uh, for, for the government in terms of forcing, if you like, the dissemination of, uh, of, of that norm, right, that everyone's supposed to have uh, the proper paperwork. 45% uh, of the people who did not have one yet had a pending case, right, which is, you know, not, not, not necessarily bad. Um, uh, some had, were claiming that they were kind of living on land which was not allowed uh, for, uh, uh, well, illegally basically occupying land for which they could not obtain the right certificate. That's 20% of the cases. Only 12% claimed that they could not afford uh, the uh, cost of obtaining it, which is quite modest. 9% um, claimed not to know about the procedures. And 7% thought it wasn't necessary, right? Um, but, you know, again, uh, overwhelmingly, uh, the reasons why people don't have one yet is because they are still engaging the system and they have, you know, recently moved or acquired it or whatever. So uh, it's a marker, I think, of a fairly, you know, uh, per, you know successful uh, policy. Uh, how much time do I have? Okay, uh, 10 minutes. Um, Length of dispute. So one thing we try to do is say, okay, how long does it last uh, from the beginning to the end? And, and what is basically the status of the dispute as you have it uh, at the time of, of, of the survey? So it could be pending. Uh, it could be solved uh, in your favor or against you, but solved uh, like a divorce. Uh, or the respondent could actually uh, not uh, verbalize. I mean, sometimes they had a non-response. They refused to say what was going on. They couldn't say what was going on because they didn't know. Um, land disputes are uh, unique in the sense that they are tricky. Uh, and in fact, this is by far the category for which there is a lot of contestation and over half of them are still unresolved. So even though people have the certificates, they still have the, those, those complex reasons that get people to argue uh, about uh, property rights. Uh, do not find a proper resolution uh, necessarily. So going to the government may be what they like to do, but it doesn't necessarily work very well, you know, when you look at the proportion of, of pending cases. Yes? Right. 25 years, yeah. No, this is much less than that. This is a question of three, four years, uh, something like this, sometimes less. Um, as I said, the, the, the worst, uh, well, the, the longest thing we have on land is someone who came to have a dispute in 54. And again, whether that's really true or not is, a, you know, it's not always true. People think that might be the reason why they have a dispute, but who knows what the legal finding would be, all right? Um, but I think there, there's, uh, there's no question that compared to India, this is a much faster tempo than, 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 than in a situation where you can you know, appeal and keep going, basically, uh, easily. Right. So, so those cases are uh, somewhat uh, problematic. Um, same with environmental dispute, you know, half of them, uh, that even though they are basically flagged by these high-powered um, social elites, uh, uh, are very difficult to, to resolve. Um, civil and economic disputes, or even labor disputes, are much more efficient, right? I mean, most of the time, three quarters or two thirds of the respondents claim that uh, uh, there has been some kind of a resolution. 
Doesn't mean they win, but, but at least there has been some kind of a, uh, a resolution. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to try to wrap it up and not go through the whole thing. This gives you a little bit of a map of, well, where we were uh, in the survey. The, the gray ones are the non-selected uh, provinces. Um, and kind of what my, my kind of takeaway is, um, I mean, I think the, the glaring finding, right, so far is that the, the legal reforms as typically uh, understood or, 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 or verbalized um, by, by the policy community are really not kind of working in the way they're supposed to, right? So uh, there's been a great deal of effort and work uh, by uh, international uh, NGOs, local NGOs, government agencies, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, various do-gooders around the world uh, to try to push for that, uh, including in Vietnam. And, and, and what we're seeing is that the, the actual use rate, if you like, of these institutions like legal aid, lawyers, uh, courts, uh, uh, remains uh, incredibly low, right? Uh, and so I think in some ways we might be barking at the wrong tree when we're trying to promote uh, legal reforms uh, in Vietnam. Uh, I am, I mean, as a political scientist, someone who has written extensively about local government, I'm a big proponent of that, but I think it's exceedingly important to understand and to invest uh, in, 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 in knowing and strengthening institutions that people actually use. And so if the commune is the place to go, I want to know everything about Vietnamese communes. Uh, I am shocked. I mean, I'm not a Vietnamese expert, but I've tried to do some literature review. I mean, what do people know about communes? Precious little, right? Uh, there's a recent report um, by the World Bank about uh, poverty alleviation and the prevalence of poverty at the commune level with very nice maps, uh, some work in environmental uh, areas, but the commune as an institution is something uh, which is not very well uh, studied or understood, and I think we'll need to push much harder uh, in the new wave of the survey to understand that, because if, in fact, people misunderstand what's going on, it's important to know that, in fact, they might be using legal aid even though they don't know that they are using legal aid, or if there's really something uh, quite different going on, in which case we need to document that uh, very uh, precisely. And so this is my, my bit of an advocacy for for local studies, right? Let me stop here. Uh, just give you a little bit of a. Uh, if we index, uh, well, I can talk about the whole overall index if you want later. But let me let me stop here to give time for for a discussion. Thank you. No need to. <laughs> Could we go back to the map a minute. Sure. Uh, Please don't test me in my geography um, of Vietnam. Yeah. I <laughs> be in real trouble. Yeah, I noticed that uh, you have a significant coverage in the highlands and hence with other ethnic groups beside the, the ethnic, ethnic Vietnamese. Do you find much highland, lowland distinction? No, we find actually it's all over the place. Um, thank you for the question. Um, so this is, the provinces are randomly selected um, as units. Uh, roughly proportional to size. As I said, we have a correction for the large provinces and, and Hanoi and Saigon. Uh, the, uh, uh, the way they were, this was done is that I took basically the human development index uh, metric by province for Vietnam, made bins of three to four. I mean, there was an adjustment because of the rounding problem, um, and uh, selected basically one province by traveling along the entire range of the HDI for Vietnam, right? To, to do that, to try to basically capture the whole range of economic circumstances. And with some geographic right? right, and so basically they were geographically diverse by, by the design of the, of the thing. Um, so, uh, of course, the, large, well, the ones that look large, are in terms of total population, sometimes quite modest, oh, right? Yeah. And obviously, uh, so, so it's, it's fairly, what's interesting is, okay, so it, just to give you a sense of, maybe this will speak to you a little better, uh, this is trying overall, we try to develop indices over the various dimensions of the questionnaire to try to group provinces uh, using kind of factor analysis to kind of try to get fairly you know, cleaner distributions. Um, so uh, you'll, you'll, you'll see that basically wealth uh, is not a particularly good marker uh, of a performance. So uh, GDP per capita here is the metric on the horizontal axis. This is the index of 0 to 1 uh, for the compound index uh, of GP. 
the winner by far is Da Nang. Uh, da Nang always wins everything in Vietnam. I don't know what's going on with that city, but they are the star of everything. So they do well in PCI, they do well in Papi, they do well in justice, they do well in politics, they do well in tourism. <laughs> there, there, there is definitely uh, a Danong spirit or something happening there that, 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 that I makes them. The right. But there there's major sites. I mean, yeah. Yeah, but, but, but there's a lot of stuff going on that's really interesting. Uh, but you see, Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh have very modest performances, right, compared to, 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 to the mean. And then you have, you know, Song La, Lang Son, who, who would have thought that you know, Lang Son and Danang would be within the same range, right? And then you have, uh, you know, municipalities that, um, you know, don't do very well, like Dak Lak, but, you know, Dak Lak is not usually not a very yeah. star performer in any way. But, you know, not the worst, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> we, have, we, we have even less, right, in terms of, 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 of performance. So. South Central, right? So this is this is kind of all over the place. There's no real clear story. I mean, the regression line is flat, right? So it's not about the economy. Um, we try to correlate, um, and this is a, a, a regression we believe in. Uh, the score that we obtain in the Public Administration Performance Index for 2012 and the JUPI score, uh, crucial because we go to the same villages. This is a study where I know it's heavily. Well, we're well, co-investigators and all of it. it's complicated. But, but basically the design is such that we use the same village lists and we go to the same localities. So we can really, when we aggregate um, two scores within the province, we are comparing apples with apples, right, by going to the same places. Uh, here, those two indicators are somewhat correlated, not, 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 not perfectly. So we're capturing different things by capturing, you know, legal institutions that, that the administrative aspect uh, does not capture. Uh, uh, and again, like in Papi, um, the geographical dimension is not what seems to be driving the results, right? So there's something else going on which is very specific to the particular kind of government that you have that, that, that gets you to, to a certain score. Uh, just to give you a, you know, this is how we kind of rate it in the end. This is like an effort to try to do, you know, strong performers versus now, we have different ways, of course, of sorting places. So this is a little controversial. Um, you can think about it as a raw index where we kind of you know, compute components and we add them up. Uh, we can use sometimes um, uh, a system where we uh, use factor analysis uh, in order to not overly represent things we have that have low variance. So basically, if something really shakes the distribution, that tends to be the, the particular dimension that's going to be emphasized by factor analysis. And then in the end, we scale it basically uh, in such a way that the top performer has to be, get a one and the lowest performer gets a zero and we basically scale people, I mean scale units within that particular range. So this is how we obtain the so-called GP3 measure, right? Um, by the bottom Right. Long is not, right? That's right. So it's, again, there are surprises. There are these really interesting clusters where good, bad, or evil, I mean, you sort of see things that you don't necessarily expect, right? And that's been true for Papi. That's also true for PCI. That's also true for, so a lot of things that we often hear, like things, the Highland story, the ethnic minority story, the North-South story, right? None of that is really cleanly, empirically proven by the kind of data we are collecting. Right. Um, now we'll see. We want to refine the questionnaire. This, we just got the, the approval and the money and the contracts to get it going. So we are about to start the new wave of JUPI, uh, and this time we will go to every single province. Uh, it's going to be a bigger uh, exercise. So we'll have a chance to see if this actually survives. We may actually tweak the sampling design. Um, but yes, again, we, we've had a lot of geographical surprises. Um, Very well. Uh, for Papi, we, Contum was one of the, <laughs> poor Contum. Uh, they didn't do so well also in the uh, Papi version. Uh, uh, they, for example, complained very uh, formally to the high-level authorities. Um, 
all the way to the presidency. The presidency reviewed the report and congratulated the UNDP for great work and asked them to continue. So <laughs> we have to assume that, you know, this is done in collaboration with, I mean, the authorities are, are deeply invested in this. I mean, the Ministry of Home Affairs has been involved in PAPI. The uh, Vietnam Lawyers Association is uh, involved here. Uh, a lot of the players you know, are working with us uh, within the government, the National Assembly, etc. Um, so they, they regard this as an important tool for them to, to understand what's happening on the ground. Right. Sure. <laughs> Dispute combined, yes. Uh, this one? Uh, the, the one we had each dispute two at a time. The this? Uh, sorry, no, no, no. You just passed it. Okay. No, 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 no. Where they go? The one with horizontal. There, you just said it. Right. Yeah. Here, okay, sorry. Now, the trade on, on the female side. Yeah. For female respondents, so these are, these are, I don't believe, I mean, these are basically household level disputes that randomly you have half women, half men who answer the survey. And so the women appear as being 50%, but, but, but again, it's... Again, uh, the whole pattern of historically uh, of uh, land, land ownership of women being more eligible to have land in Vietnam than, than in, in China, for example. So to me, this, this demonstrates that um, uh, a, gen a gender aspect I, I, I'm very skeptical. I think the land question actually uh, mentions the household as the unit for the dispute. Uh, and so, and because randomly it's 50-50 in terms of the, resp you know, the probability of having a f male or a female respondent, I wouldn't really make too much of that. Uh, the Vietnamese government recently has made a, you know, a rule that the name of the woman in a couple must be written explicitly on the certificate. You know, because historically that was not true. Uh, and this is the degree to which this is being implemented varies also by, by province. We try to actually get at that. Uh, and there are some, some differences across space, but not, not huge. Um, but I, I'm not sure the, the, I'm not sure we know enough with enough detail uh, about <laughs> gender to say clearly that this is. Maybe it's too fresh. Maybe this is simply, you know, it takes a while for, you know, the, the issue to mature into a situation where enough people divorce, having had enough years of uh, control over the land to generate enough cases, you know. Maybe that's what's going on, right? Uh, we just, if we wait 10, 10, 15 years, we'll have more of that, right? Uh, the divorce rate in Vietnam is not as high as it is in China, for instance. So, so that could also be one reason. Yes, sir, and then, yeah. Oh, sure. Hello. So, um, in comparing to China, I'm, I'm wondering, in, in some sense, the fact that people tend to go to the communes doesn't surprise me that much. And you, I mean, it's, it's not that dissimilar from China in a lot of ways. Now, in Chinese legal scholarship, usually they're looking at mediation versus arbitration versus right. adjudication. And it looks like you didn't look at it really in that way. Well, we did, but they don't do this. <laughs> That's the problem. Um, well, yeah, well, let me be clear. Communes in Vietnam are not communes like China. So they're not people's communes. They're communes in the way the French colonial authorities define communes from the French civil system, right? I mean, so these are the, these kinds of units. Um, uh, well, my, my I think we can, you know, I don't know if we know how we think about that, whether it's more natural to go to the thing that's been around for a long time, you know, because it's been Well, well my question really was in China, there's official policies and, and systems in place that sort of encourage people to try to resolve things at the lower level. In, in addition, you have the whole phenomenon of local protectionism at the court level, the judges yes. that are appointed you know, by party officials with local control, et cetera, et cetera, which dissuades people a lot of times from, from using the, the courts. So how much of that is, uh, 
somewhat similar in Vietnam, or is the dynamic different even though you're seeing where they're going to being somewhat similar? I think it's very similar in terms of everything else, you know, the kind of uh, initiative to push people into mediation and legal aid, you know, true in both countries. Uh, political control of courts, true in both countries. Uh, partial legal reforms, true in both countries, right? The one thing that I think varies dramatically between those two places is the degree of accountability of local officials at the commune level. So this would be basically a township in China, Zhen, right? Uh, appointed by the government, the la lowest level of you know the, 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 the officials who eat the emperor's grain, as they say in China, right? Um, in the in the Vietnamese case, there are serious elections, so there is probably an incentive for people to be quite responsive to demands that people make at these uh, at, at this level, and I think that's probably why we see so many Vietnamese being willing to do that. When you look at the data for China, I mean similar data for 05, uh, people don't go to the township. Uh, they just don't, <laughs> uh, because uh, this is you only go to Shangfang if you basically have a have a you know, letters and visit kind of process, and that's usually not the level where you want to go anyway because it doesn't have the authority to solve your problem. So people want to go higher up, right? Uh, but the idea that you would engage uh, this administrative office uh, to the extent that it's true in Vietnam is quite unique, I think. Uh, yes. Ma'am. So I'm wondering. Um, what is the motivation of the central government in Vietnam to promote legal reforms? Whether they think this is an intrinsically good thing or because there, there is some hidden political agenda. Because for me, as a student of development, I don't think that legal reforms are intrinsically good. The important thing is whether disputes get resolved, but the way they get resolved, you know, doesn't really matter so much, but it seems that in Vietnam, the central government is trying to push for legal reforms as an intrinsic good, and I wonder why that is the case. Um, because as we know in China, they do that because for legitimacy reasons to undercut local governments. And I'm wondering what the reasons are in Vietnam. Well, this is a 60,000 dong or dollar or yuan <laughs> question, right? <laughs> Depending on your chosen currency. Um, it's a little bit difficult to say. I, I think there is a, a very clear, I mean, widespread understanding or, or belief uh, that um, economic reforms require some commitment to legal reforms, and that basically contracts and uh, property rights uh, and, and, and commerce uh, cannot function particularly well uh, if you don't have good legal institutions. And in the case of Vietnam, where even more so than in China, you have so many uh, uh, family businesses and, 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 and small-scale entrepreneurs. In a way, the, the difference between legal reforms affecting the masses, as we would say in China, and then the, the commercial aspect, which in China tends to be quite distinctive you know, uh, from the rest of, of society, um, kind of merge in the Vietnamese case. So, so everybody, in a way, is concerned because everybody kind of has a business, or, or many people know somebody who have a business, and so it's important to, to, to defend that. Um, uh, as I said, I think Vietnam also has, I mean, uh, the fundamental difference is that the government in Hanoi is not the government in Beijing. The government in Hanoi has now a multiplicity of, um, uh, uh, of co-players to worry about, right, both within the system, who you know, these are entities that compete for national office and for various political jobs. Um, uh, the selectorate, to use this in Shirk's term, the people who ultimately end up choosing the central leaders, right? So who, who, who picks the premier, who picks the president, who picks the general secretary, are typically uh, officials who come from these provinces, right? Uh, the 62 now, three provinces of Vietnam. Um, so it's, in, it's important basically for the government to, to generate plausible, plausibly good outcomes at the local level, uh, because ultimately this is sanctioned by the ballot box, right? Uh, in the Vietnamese case. The Chinese case, it's a, you know, it's more tricky, right? <laughs> uh, but I think in the Vietnamese case, it's m fairly clearly an economic issue. Now, of course, we don't have here anything to say, uh, you know, data on the criminal aspect, which is another problem where you would probably find difficulties um, uh, where you know, well, there's room for improvement, clearly. But, um, but we, we, didn't, we did not and wouldn't go there for this particular version.
so. All of the colleges and for, thank you, and actually one more word. For the graduate students, if you ever have an interest uh, in uh, knowing more, using or accessing the data, whether it's PAPI or JUPI or anything else, let me know. Uh, the data is not freely available, uh, you know, it's complicated bureaucracies, but it is available. In other words, <laughs> if you ask kindly, uh, it's possible to, to analyze it and actually quite a few things have been produced recently with the PAPI uh, work that we've been doing, which has a longer history than the JUPI work. But I mean, we, we aim also to, to do the same for, for the JUPI datasets. Thank you. You're welcome.